Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all for today's Q Farm seminar. Um, today, it's my privilege to welcome Professor Javier Sanchez Yamagishi. Um, Professor Sanchez Yamagishi did his PhD work at MIT studying twisted graphene heterostructures and then went on to a postdoc in the Lupin group at Harvard, where he explored using spin qubits as nanoscale magnetometers for 2D material. Since 2018, he's been a professor at UC Irvine, where he and his group study quantum electronic transport in 2D and topological materials. Um, so as always, please type questions into the chat as you have them. Um, and with that, I'll let Javier take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so it's great to um, be able to talk to you all today. Um, so today, uh, let's see, just before I get started with my talk, so I did send a link to this poll that I said, so I sent on poll everywhere. So if you don't mind humoring me, uh, if you click on that link, I think most of you answered the first question, which was, uh, what stage of your career are you in? Uh, so I'm just going to uh, get the responses here. Uh, good. And then I'm actually going to activate a second question. All right. So if you go back to that link, and I'm going to uh, activate the second question here. Um, and then you can fill out the second. The, if you go to the same link, then um, you can answer the second question there. And then I'll, I'll have a sense of who is, uh, who's here and what your background is. So if you just click on the link again, and we'll see if this works. And sorry, it's gonna be a little rough just because this is my first time doing this. Uh, but I can see from this poll that um, most of you are uh, either grad students and postdocs, so that's cool. Okay. And um, Evan, I'll just paste in the answer from those of you who responded so far. Uh, so we just saw that, uh, which quantum are you most into? And we see that, we got some quantum materials people mainly, um, and we got some sensing people and some simulation people. So that's uh, that's cool. Um, all right, cool. So just so we get a sense of where we're at. All right, I'm gonna make my screen full screen here. Um, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. So, uh, okay, so I realize it's my first time doing PowerPoint, so I'm not gonna be able to see the chat. So maybe, um, if you could just uh, feel free to interrupt with questions or if a question comes up in the chat, and I'd love to uh, hear about it. Um, and you can just interrupt me actually as I go along. Okay, cool. So let's see here, I got my pen working. Excellent. All right, so uh, yeah, so my name is um, Javier Sanchez Yamagishi. So I'm a assistant professor at UC Irvine. And um, today I'm actually gonna be talking about talk work that I mainly did while I was at, at Harvard. Uh, for my postdoc. Um, so since 2018, I, I started a group at UC Irvine and we're kind of still getting things going off, off the ground. And uh, I'll mention at the end briefly sort of things that we've been working on. But, um, but today I'll be talking about this work, which is still of great interest to me, which is that of quantum probes of two-dimensional materials. And I'll, I'll be spending most of my time talking about this, um, this phonon Cherenkov amplification effect that we saw in graphene. Okay. So with that, let's dive in. All right, so we got that question out of the way. A lot of you are quantum materials people. Makes sense. Um, okay, so um, all right, so just to set the stage generally, right? Um, so I'm a condensed matter physicist and I'm interested in studying condensed matter physics. And uh, generally that means that we have some material and we wanna study it and we wanna probe it uh, to get a sense of its internal structure. We wanna know what excitations does it have and we wanna know what types of fields that it generates, okay? Um, and uh, so that's kind of the first thing. And, um, and very quickly, once you get into this field, uh, you start to realize is that um, fundamental condensed matter studies really require uh, really good single crystal materials. All right, so that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing is that um, clean single crystals and new materials are generally very small. And that kind of determines um, a lot of the game. Uh, so, um, if you can grow a bigger crystal and, um, and uh, that you can use your probe on, then, then you're going to be able to get some good physics out. So to give you an old example, this is from uh, when I was in grad school, um, the group of Young Lee now at Stanford, he was at MIT at the time, uh, he, they were able to grow really grow big crystals at Herbert Smithite. 
okay, which was a candidate quantum spin liquid. And they were able to grow big enough that they can actually do neutron scattering on it and see um, some of the uh, um, behavior of spin excitations in this material. And it all came down to getting a big enough crystal that they could work with their probe, all right? Um, but you see here that if you want to study the kind of most cutting edge uh, physics, you have to have probes that can work with small materials because we can grow small materials more easily first. And, um, but there's another aspect of it, which is that often uh, the smallness is intrinsic to the physics that we're after because we want to look at physics that involves confinement and, um, or we want to study some low dimensional system. And so this is uh, uh, very clearly the case if you're going to study two dimensional or Van der Waals layered materials. And so these are materials that are a few atoms thick. And because they're in materials, we don't get them in giant sizes. The lateral size of the crystal is also small. All right. So this is a crystal structure of some uh, 2D material. It is a few atoms thick, each of these layers, right? Um, and then on the right here, I have a couple of uh, example images from some uh, papers over history, which are showing very nice results from a 2D material device. And what you're going to see is that these materials are, again, very thin, but they're also very small and lateral sizes. Okay, so this is a at the time what was considered a giant high quality graphene device. You can see that it's a little over 10 microns large. Likewise, tungsten telluride device, a 2D topological insulator, it is 10 microns in size. And, um, and then likewise with this uh, intrinsic quantum anomalous hall material, recent paper, this material um, is only uh, 10 microns in size in the clean region between electrodes. So we're talking about small crystals. And uh, for comparison here, we have a human hair, okay, which is many tens of microns large. So we're dealing with small crystals and that requires coming up with specialized techniques to study these tiny materials. Um, sorry, here, just realizing, trying to figure out what kind of, oops, I didn't want to do that. Sorry, I just exited out of the presentation. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. Uh, back into it. All right. So, and then just really quickly, I thought this was something very cute that I came across recently is that, you know, this thing of using very small crystals to do some cutting edge studies, this is not just some weird condensed matter thing. Um, so, actually, um, in the study of plutonium, okay, um, there's this, uh, at the time when they were studying, discovering and studying plutonium, they could only make it in very small quantities. And what's crazy uh, is that they had to use these, uh, these specialized um, ultra microchemistry techniques, which involves using manipulators that are under microscopes uh, to, to deal and manipulate with these small quantities of materials that they were dealing with. Um, and so this is funny for me because this looks very similar uh, to uh, the setups that we use uh, to look at 2D materials, all right? So that's one interesting thing. Um, but the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, people built, uh, uh, you know, after Manhattan Project, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars in 1943 uh, to build giant um, industrial processing plants um, based upon experiments that were done on these uh, microgram quality uh, quantities of plutonium. All right. So, um, so there's a long history of this idea that when you're dealing with a new material, uh, you can only isolate it in really small quantities. And so you want to have probes that can deal with those small quantities to figure out if you want to spend more effort to make more of it in a larger scale. So it's not just a condensed matter thing. Um, you know, there's a, this legacy of, of uh, a nuclear research as well um, that use looking at small stuff. So, um, so again, we're talking about then 2D layer materials. And, um, and the point here that I want to say is just that this is a really wide material class. It has a wide uh, set of different uh, um, material properties that exhibit semiconductors, superconductors, magnets, topological insulators, et cetera. And, and um, moreover, you can make heterostructures out of these different 2D materials. So these are materials like graphene that exfoliate uh, via uh, using scotch tape method, for example. You can separate out the layers. I mean, you can stack them together again to get some combination heterostructure that has some desired properties that you engineer. Um, a lot of attention has been also paid more recently come to the fact that you have this twist degree of freedom that you can control to get some more patterns between the different layers. Um, but the kind of more general point to tell you, you know, try to explain why 2D layered materials are so interesting 
in a very general way is um, not just because it's you know trendy and graphene is cool, but it's also because first we can grow really high quality single crystals of these materials. They're, they're big crystals, they're high quality, and they're gonna have pristine surfaces. And if you wanna study two dimensional physics, there's a straightforward way to get it. You thin it down, okay? But that thinning process can still keep the quality of the material very high. And the third thing, and this is something that's kind of more subtle and not many people appreciate is that it's really easy to make a device out of a 2D layered material because you can easily make it thin, all right? And making devices is important because people wanna attach electrodes to these materials and study their electronic properties. And that's much easier if it's thin because the way we process electronic devices is all depends on having two thin, flat things. Um, so, so that's another important thing. Okay, so, um, so then kind of leading up then to the probing part, um, is that 2D materials are very thin and they're very small and they also generate uh, interesting magnetic fields, okay? Um, so a magnetic field can be generated because you have some charge current that's flowing through the material. Um, if it's superconducting, then it'll exhibit diamagnetism. So you can see how it expels magnetic fields. It may be a magnetic material, so you wanna measure that, or it may have some localized quantum spins inside of it that you want to measure. And, um, because these materials are really small, uh, it's not going to generate very large magnetic field. Okay, uh, so so right away off the bat, you're going to know that you're going to be in a regime where you really need to measure magnetic fields that are kind of in the nanotesla to microtesla range, and you need to be able to get really close to the material. And so that means that traditional bulk probes are just not going to be sensitive enough. All right, so people cannot do neutron scattering on uh, single atom thick materials that are tens of microns in size. And likewise, you're not gonna be able to do NMR or, or electro, electromagnetic resonance on these types of materials because the volume size is too small um, and it's not gonna work out. On the other hand, um, you know, it seems like it'd be worth a try because one, there's all these interesting things that we could measure. And two, um, the 2D electronic system is very open, right? Um, the materials are all surface. And so you can really bring a probe really close to that material of interest. It's not buried inside of some bulk. And, um, and so there are some opportunities here for kind of make, developing new probes. All right, and so then that brings us then to the kind of motivation of this work, which was to take 2D materials, right? And combine them with this new nanoscale magnetometry probe, which was the um, diamond envy center, spin qubit. Any questions so far on the beginning of this talk? Feel free to interrupt at any point, especially in this part, because we're gonna talk about envy centers, which may be uh, less familiar to some of you. So, um, okay, so this is um, our diamond envy center, and this is what we're gonna use as our magnetometry probe to measure magnetic fields coming from 2D materials. And uh, so the idea is that it is a defect in diamond, all right? You take two carbon atoms out, and you replace one of them with a nitrogen atom. And we really like this system because it really behaves like a trapped atom in a diamond vacuum, all right? Um, and so there's two aspects to this. One of them is that what you get in the end is an electronic spin qubit, all right? So there is a spin uh, one that's bound to this NV center site. And along with it is also an optical dipole moment. So it means there's an optical transition that you can address uh, by shining light. Um, and so these two things together give you a really nice pairing of spin qubit properties and also optical properties as well. Um, and I should just mention that these um, NV centers are generally studied inside of synthetically grown uh, um, diamonds, um, which are, and, and the main provider of them is Element 6, which is a company that's owned by De Beers. Okay, so, how can you do magnetometry with a diamond envy center? Okay, and this is kind of actually generically how you could do magnetometry with some sort of qubit that has some, um, that can be manipulated optically. So, okay, so first thing, right? This is, um, the envy center has a electronic spin one. All right, so it's formed by two spin one halves that are combining together to form a, a spin one system. And the first really nice thing about this envy center is because of the properties of diamond, which has low spin orbit coupling, can be isotopically purified. Um, it has uh, um, 
uh, very high, uh, uh, high energy vibrational modes. And the result of that is that if you polarize this NV center spin, it retains that spin polarization for a really long time at room temperature, okay, milliseconds, which is really, really long, right? So it's a really long spin lifetime, uh, otherwise known as the T1 time of your qubit. The second thing, which is like pretty remarkable and beautiful, is that if you shine green light uh, onto the NV center, it polarizes. So that's awesome. You don't have to cool it down in some dill fridge or something like that, as people do with um, semiconductor spin qubits. You just shine light on it, and it'll polarize into a, um, a, a, a spin state with high fidelity. For similar um, microscopic reasons, you can also read out the spin state by optically as well. So if you shine green light on it, the NV center will fluoresce red. And if it's in the MS equals zero state, it'll fluoresce red more brightly than if it's in the MS equals plus minus one state. Uh, so with that, you can distinguish whether you're in the zero or the plus minus one state. And the last important quantity, quality is that um, because it is a uh, spin one system, it has a magnetic dipole moment, it is sensitive to magnetic fields. Uh, we have a Zeeman effect, which will split these plus minus one levels. And, um, and so you have this level structure, which is sensitive to magnetic fields. And you can address this level structure by shining in AC magnetic fields, at these microwave frequencies, and you can address these transitions, do spectroscopy, and in the end, measure this magnetic field. And that's how you can do magnetometry. Any questions on this part so far? Sometimes people have questions about this NV operation. And I'm happy to answer kind of anything. Does it look like there's any questions so far? OK. Yeah, it's kind of you know weird with PowerPoint. Like I'm used to, uh, I don't usually use PowerPoint for presentations, actually. So like, can't see the like chat. <laughs> all right. So um, all right. So that's how we do NV mag optical magnetometry. Um, so now, why is it a good nanoscale magnetometer? So there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that like, which is really special and unique to to kind of atomic defects, is that if you're going to use it as a sensor, I mean, it's really as small of a sensor as you can make, right? It's defined by two atom defects in, in, in diamond, so it's only a couple of angstroms in, in volume. And also, we can implant it to be nanometers from the surface of the diamond. So we can, so it's really close to the surface of diamond, and then we can bring it really close to some other material of interest. Um, it operates over a very wide temperature range from cryogenic to above room temperature, uh, and it's also really highly sensitive. Um, so uh, let's just say that it can measure really small magnetic fields at both uh, DC um, and AC frequencies as well, going up to uh, gigahertz and many gigahertz in frequency. So it's highly sensitive and is also relatively high bandwidth as far as a magnetic sensor is concerned. Oh, and so just as reference, for example, uh, it has no problem measuring um, a single electronic spin uh, if, if it is placed uh, about 10 nanometers away. So just to flash a couple of examples of people using these NV centers for various types of nanoscale sensing, it's been used to detect single proteins. It's been used to probe spin waves and magnetic materials. Um, some kind of more recent interesting work is actually studying 2D two-dimensional materials that are magnetic. So this is a cryoscanning magnetometry work from a group of uh, Patrick Maltinsky, where we can actually see the domain structure of um, uh, of, of the 2D magnet. Um, and what's cool is that you can see here the scale bar, one micron. So this is a scanning uh, NV center where they scan a diamond with a single NV center in it above a sample. They can actually map out the magnetic fields with um, you know, tens of nanometers resolution. So NV center is a great nanoscale magnetic probe. Um, and so today, what I'm going to talk to you about, I guess, over the course of the next, um, you know, 25 minutes is um, I'm going to try to touch briefly on two experiments here where we're using nanoscale magnetometry to study 2D materials, actually materials that are only one uh, atomic layer thick. Uh, so one of them is the first NMR measurement of a 2D monolayer. And then the second one is using the NV center to map out uh, noise in um, a graphene sheet. And actually we can uh, find out a pretty interesting um, effect when we drive the graphene. So first um, NMR. Uh, so um, I just want to brief touch this on this very quickly, um, just because I think it's a really cool basic experiment. Um, and so the idea is to measure um, 
nuclear magnetic resonance in a monolayer material, okay? And so nuclear magnetic resonance is where we're trying to um, measure the magnetic fields generated by the nuclear spins inside of a material, okay? So boron nitride has, um, uh, you know, nucleus, which is made up of boron or has atoms made up of boron and nitrogen, right? Uh, there's different isotopes of boron and those all have um, a, a magnetic moment that generates a little magnetic field, which you can detect. And that's what you do in NMR. Um, but the, the problem with um, of NMR in general, right, is that you need to polarize these spins to actually get some net magnetic field, or else all the spins will just cancel out. You don't get any net polarization. So this usually means that you have to apply a big magnetic field, maybe even go to low temperatures, all right? Um, and this is in the end why when you go get an MRI scan, they put a big honking magnet on your head. So, uh, but what's really cool, if you have a nanoscale magnetic sensor, is that if you go to the nanoscale and you're probing a really small volume of spins, now the spins, they're not gonna all cancel out because you have a small population and there's always gonna be some net little spin polarization, okay? This is like, we can call it a statistical polarization, all right? Uh, and so the statistical polarization, that's gonna go as square root n, where n is the number of spins you have. And um, as you kind of shrink down the volume of spins that you have, the, the you know, net fractional amount of this kind of statistical polarization is gonna grow in size uh, to the point where you always are gonna have some amount of spins that uh, are net polarized and you can detect those. Um, so, uh, so that's what was done in this experiment. We were not the first to measure a NMR signal with an NB center. Uh, we were just the first to try that with a 2D monolayer, in this case, hexagonal boron nitride. And um, I'm not gonna go into this too much. I just wanna say that um, this has a lot of kind of cool general quantum sensor stuff in it. We have a single NV center that we use. It's an isotopically purified diamond. And what you do is you take your NV spin qubit and we can flip it, the spin state, uh, by applying a pi pulse to it, all right? Using a microwave line. And, and so by flipping the NV center, we can flip it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, so that it uh, filters out all other magnetic signals except for a signal that's oscillating at a specific frequency, which we can control, all right? And so what we do is we, we target um, the frequency, uh, the resonance frequency of the nuclear spins that we're trying to sense, all right? So we, we, we did exactly this, and we're actually able to observe a nuclear magnetic resonance signal coming from the boron atoms inside of this HBN. So here you have a plot of NMR contrast, as a function of frequency. And you can see that there's these various transition lines that correspond to various uh, nuclear spin transitions inside of the, uh, coming from the boron 11 atoms. So, um, so it's just, you know, it's just NMR spectroscopy of these uh, boron 11 atoms. Um, and so what was kind of cute that we could do with this experiment is that we can actually measure the, um, the magnetic resonance frequency of these um, boron atoms inside the HBN. And we can compare how it looks like in a bulk versus a monolayer. Okay, so you see here, the red is monolayer HBN signal. And actually we see a, a clear uh, shift in frequency compared to the bulk. And this is not so surprising because what we're measuring here is actually um, what's known as an NQR signal. So this is a, a shift that's due to a quadruple resonance of the uh, boron 11 atom. And it's actually sensitive to electric field gradients inside the material. And so what we're observing here is that um, the monolayer HBN has some internal electric field gradient, which is different than the bulk. Um, which maybe is not so surprising. Um, what we now know about these materials is that, um, especially boron nitride, is that they're really sensitive to um, strain inside the material. So actually if you strain them out of plane, they develop uh, electric fields. <laughs> uh, and so it's not so surprising that in the monolayer form, there are gonna be some different strain structure compared to bulk. Um, but more generally, it was just a nice proof of principle that we were able to show that we can actually measure NMR signal from a 2D material. Um, and this was enabled by getting both within 10 nanometers between the NV center and the material, and also the excellent coherence properties of NV centers in this isotopically purified diamond. Can I interrupt with a question here? Yeah. Um, so on the previous slide where you showed the actual um, experimental sequence you used, mm -hmm. um, can you comment on the um, 
necessity slash um, what gain you get from flipping the pi pulses between the x and y axes versus just keeping them around one axis. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, so this is a thing that like, yeah, I definitely know the least about <laughs> given them a condensed matter person. But no, no, I, I really got into studying these pulse sequences during my postdoc. And so, um, you know, my understanding is that, you know, you, you flip around different axes. Um, basically, what you're doing in the end is you're, uh, you're, when you do these pulses, you're actually more strongly affected by errors in, in your pulses, right? So like the size of the pulse, the shape of the pulse. And so uh, by, flipping, uh, by flipping between the X and Y axes, you can help to cancel out these errors in your, in your pulse. Um, there probably is some like very specific type of error that's corrected by going between X and Y. Uh, but I think I, I imagine that the orientation of your, of, your, of, your, of your field, AC field with respect to NV center is one error that you could have. Um, but I don't, I don't remember for sure. Does that answer your question somewhat? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I also have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so there is a hydrogen on the surface of diamond, which has yes. a, which also has a nuclear spin. Yes. So how can you, uh, how can you remove that effect from the experiment? We don't remove it. It's always there. Um, but that's the beauty of spectroscopy, right? Is that um, you can choose which frequency that you look at. And so, uh, so yes, there's definitely a hydrogen signal, uh, but the um, the frequency at which the proton from the hydrogen um, has a spin transition is very different than, uh, than the boron. So basically by looking at different frequencies, we can see. And so in fact, we actually see that there is a layer of, uh, uh, of, of something that has hydrogen in it that's between the boron nitride and the diamond. Okay, and correct me if I'm wrong, but are mm -hmm. you saying that you, you measure this, the you measure the nuclear magnetic resonance of the single boron atom? Uh, good question. No, we're always, so we're, you know, kind of look at this picture here. So you're always uh, sensing some volume of spins and actually um, it's very hard for the NB center to measure the signal from a single uh, nucleus. It's too small of a signal. So um, in the end, we're actually probing about like thousands to 10,000 uh, spins at least at a time. Uh, and we're integrating that signal. Is that because of the sensitivity or the spatial resolution? Spatial resolution. So the NV center okay. is sitting, uh, um, you know, some distance away from the material. Okay, and so because it's sitting some distance away, it naturally is probing some area that's kind of roughly given by the distance of the NV center to the material. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay. If there's any other questions, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, at any point. Um, okay, so that was the NMR measurement. Uh, it was kind of, kind of a pretty quick result. Um, and you know, I'm really looking forward to people figuring out how to do these types of measurements in a cryostat, specifically the NMR ones. They're a bit more demanding, uh, but if we could do it in a cryostat, then that would make it more generally useful for um, doing NMR condensed matter systems. Uh, but now we're gonna move, switch gears. We're, not gonna, we're gonna talk now about electronic currents and, start, and using the NB Center to probe electronic currents, in this case in graphene. Um, uh, so this is a much simpler <laughs> uh, measurement and the, kind of the one, uh, so this is a, you know, at a level that me as a condensed matter physicist can really like get behind. Um, so this is a, uh, so it doesn't involve a complicated pulse sequence anymore. This is what's known as a spin relaxation or T1 measurement. And the idea is that the um, NV center spin structure looks like the following, it has this MS equals zero state, uh, which is separated by three gigahertz from the plus minus one states. And so what you do is something very simple. You just initialize a spin by shining green light, and that will pump it into the zero state here, okay? And then what you do is you just wait some time, all right? And as you wait, some noise is gonna come along and it's gonna just mix up the spin state. Uh, so that you're in a thermal population where each of the states is equally occupied. And then you just measure um, that uh, uh, decay, okay? So the way it looks like is that you start off with a polarized signal and then you wait some time and the signal is gonna decay exponentially uh, with a characteristic time, which is given by um, T1, uh, which is uh, you know, given by one over the relaxation rate. All right. And um, the point is that this, because this is a magnetic transition, um, it's dominated by magnetic noise. So magnetic noise is what's gonna cause the spin to relax and return to a thermal equilibrium state. And 
then there's a question, okay, what kind of magnetic noise do materials generate? And it turns out that if a material is a conductor, uh, then the noise is dominated by current fluctuations. Okay, so you have charged currents in your material, they're fluctuating around, they generate magnetic noise above the material, and that will cause the envy center to decay. And so this was an experiment here um, done in the uh, Lucan group at Harvard, where they took an envy center, uh, and it normally has a very slow decay, but then if you put it near a metal film, then it decays very fast due to the current fluctuations in the metal. So you can use this to measure current fluctuations. That's kind of neat. Uh, what can we do with that? So, um, so that's what we set out to do. We were going to see what kind of um, things we can do if you compare current fluctuation measurements, uh, comparing a local probe, where you can look at kind of that spatial distribution of noise, and comparing it to a global probe. And the type of physics we were interested in was in driven electron instabilities. So what are electron instabilities? So this may not be something you're so familiar with um, because often, let's say if you do condensed matter physics, we usually like to study si uh, systems in equilibrium or close equilibrium and linear response. Uh, but there's a whole range of interesting physics where you drive a system very hard. And if there's some non-linearities in your system, it can lead to some interesting instabilities or other effects. Um, so there's a lot of examples of these. Um, you know, one effect which is very important is the gun effect, which is an effect where if you take certain semiconductors and you drive them with a large electric field, they will actually spontaneously start generating um, high frequency oscillations. It's called the gun effect. And it's due to a, um, a region where the material develops some negative differential resistance when you apply a large electric field. Don't have time to discuss it. It's a very interesting effect. Uh, briefly, let me just mention the original reason why we started this project is that we were, we were trying to study hydrodynamic instabilities. And so at the time, uh, uh, back then, uh, there was this interest in graphene um, that the electrons in graphene exhibit uh, behave like a hydrodynamic fluid. And so the thought was that, well, if it behaves like a hydrodynamic fluid, maybe it'll exhibit hydrodynamic instabilities, all right? Fluids um, that are, are driven at, at, at high velocities, and if they have low Reynolds number, then uh, or high Reynolds number, then they high Reynolds number, then they will spontaneously, um, you know, exhibit uh, instabilities. In fact, more famously, right, they'll become uh, exhibit chaotic dynamics at at high at high um, velocities. All right, so this is what we were trying to do, <laughs> and what we actually ended up seeing is the following, which is this effect known as uh, Cherenkov amplification, which is another effect uh, which actually had never been seen before in a 2D material that has been seen in semiconductors a long time ago, where if you drive an electronic system and you're able to drive it to a high enough drift velocity, it can start to uh, spontaneously emit phonons. Uh, and an effect which is similar to Cherenkov radiation of light, this is a Cherenkov radiation of phonons. And uh, just briefly, let me say that all of these signals, the idea is that you get some AC signal out from some DC drive. Okay, and so that's been the logic in looking at fluctuations in the current because they'll tell you if you're spontaneously generating some AC signals. All right, how am I doing on time here? Okay, gotta kind of speed it up a little bit. Um, let me just briefly say that graphene is a good system for doing these types of studies because it's very clean. And so that means that you can, if you apply a small electric field, the average velocity of the electrons can be really, really high. In fact, it can be as large as 10 to the 5 meters per second at a pretty small uh, electric field. And, and what that will do is it'll tilt the Fermi surface of the electrons so that's very strongly out of equilibrium. You can maybe get some interesting things to happen. OK, so that's the experiment. Um, and what is it that we saw? All right, so just as a reminder, we're going to be comparing global noise measurements to local noise measurements that are measured by the NV center. OK, so this is just fabrication. Long story short, if you want to measure with NV centers, uh, we chose to make our devices on a diamond substrate that has NV centers uh, in it. So we put our graphene device on top of the diamond. Um, and then first, I'm going to start with some global measurements. So no NV center involved. I'm just measuring the current noise in the system over the whole device, integrated over the whole device. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare disordered and clean devices with each other. All right. Um, and what was kind of interesting is that um, if you take the disordered device and the clean device, and then you just apply some uh, electric field across it, uh, what we saw was that um, 
disordered devices, um, so this, this, this plot here is what the one we're going to look at. Uh, the x-axis is applied electric field, but actually written here in terms of the power of the bias. And then the y-axis is noise, all right? And what we found was that um, if you drive a graphing device and if it's disordered, it doesn't, it, it doesn't generate much noise. It's actually pretty quiet. Uh, but if it's very clean, it generates a ton of noise, all right? So what's going on there? Why is it so noisy? You would expect maybe the other way, but disordered devices would be more noisy. It's actually a clean device is very noisy. Um, so what's going on here? So first we looked at the disordered device and if you get some noise signal, you always wanna look at the spectrum because it tells you a lot about the, the origin of the noise. Uh, so this is the spectrum of the noise, okay? Plotted in units of Kelvin, which I'll explain in a second. And the x-axis is frequency. And what you see here is that the, um, the noise spectrum is actually very flat at high frequencies. Okay, and that's expected. Uh, that's because it's thermal noise. So thermal noise, otherwise known as Johnson noise, is famously white. It has a flat frequency distribution, where the power spectral density should be uh, exactly given by KBT. So this is a really cool thing where electronic noise allows you to measure the temperature of electrons. Uh, so the, the Johnson noise, the thermal noise, is just proportional to KBT, all right? Um, and this was consistent with what people had previously seen in disordered graphene. So, um, so then what happened when we measured a clean device is we looked at this clean device, we saw that it was very noisy, um, and we can look at the frequency of spectrum of the noise. And what we saw was that um, it's extremely noisy, all right? Um, we're getting noise powers that are not measured in hundreds of Kelvin, but are measured in thousands of Kelvin, okay? And, um, and also, it's somehow larger at large frequency, at small frequencies. All right, so there's a very clear frequency dependence to the noise. Uh, so that was pretty odd. All right, so very noisy sample. Uh, that's clean and it's, it's noisy at low frequencies. So um, all right, let's see here. I've got ten minutes. Okay, that's good. So so this is the story. We have clean devices and they exhibit very large noise at low frequencies. Um, another thing that was weird is that we could also measure the AC conductivity. So the AC conductivity should be very much related to the AC noise. So it's important to measure both of them. Um, and actually we didn't expect to see much because in graphene, the AC conductivity is supposed to be completely flat going up to very high frequencies like terahertz uh, because graphene is just um, pretty boring material actually uh, for the most part um, uh, in terms of um, its frequency dependence. So we were very surprised then to see that actually if you take a clean graphene device and you apply voltage across it, the AC conductivity begins being pretty flat, uh, but then as you apply increasing drive field, um, the AC conductivity, so this is a differential conductivity, it's a function of frequency, and you see that it actually rolls off at low frequencies. So there's a suppression of the AC conductivity at low frequencies, also completely unexpected. Um, there's this suppression here. So, um, so let me just recap all that I told you. I know it's a lot, especially if you've never seen noise or AC conductivity measurements before, but maybe the summary is more clear. So we make clean graphing devices and we bias them. When we bias them, they become very noisy. And also the conductivity becomes suppressed, um, but only at low frequencies. At high frequencies is fine. Uh, and so that's what I'm saying here. The effect is strongest at frequencies below a gigahertz. And as far as electronics are concerned, gigahertz is actually pretty sw a small frequency. Um, and this frequency dependence is independent of electronic parameters. So it doesn't matter how much voltage we apply, doesn't matter how we dope the material, doesn't matter the temperature, but it does depend on the sample length. So we make the sample longer, or sorry, shorter. So that's what we did in this data set here. We have a six micron device instead of 9.5 microns. And we see that this roll off occurs at a higher frequency. Hmm. Make it shorter, higher frequency. So this is what made us think about phonons. Because phonons are slow, uh, yet they may depend on the length of your sample. Okay, so I don't have time to go into this into too deep, much detail, but let me give you a picture of kind of the mechanism that we were starting to think about. So electrons, they interact with each other, with phonons on a very fast time scale. 
All right. So for example, electron phonon scattering in graphene occurs at a picosecond time scale. That's really fast. That's nowhere near a gigahertz, right? A gigahertz would be nanosecond time scale. But an electron can emit a phonon and that phonon can live a really long time because you have a very clean graphene device. And so what we were thinking about is like, what if this phonon lives for some long period of time and then interacts with some other electron? Could that build up some correlations and some noise over long time scales? Um, and so, yes, indeed, something like this can occur. And, um, and it has an effect which is akin to Cherenkov radiation of light. So what's the idea? So the idea is that if you think about things from the point of view of the phonons, okay, so this is the phonon decay rate, the phonons are constantly decaying via ion harmonic processes, right? But they can also be generated by the electrons, right? The electrons can generate a phonon. And this can actually be a stimulated process if there's some other phonons in the area. Um, and they're also being absorbed at the same time as well by the electrons. And it turns out that if you think about your this process of emission, emitting phonons and absorbing phonons, okay? Um, the um, emission is going to be much less than the absorption if you don't apply a drift velocity to your electronic system, okay? But if you, if you do apply a drift velocity to your electronic system, what it does is it tilts the Fermi surface. And when you tilt it enough so that the drift velocity exceeds the sound velocity of your material, then it turns out that emission of phonons becomes more efficient than absorption. You get more emission than the absorption. And that's pretty important because, because you can have this stimulated emission process. That means that emission can, if you emit a little bit, those phonons can then cause the emission of more phonons, which can then cause the emission of more phonons, and your phonon population can grow and grow and grow. And this is the process of, of Cherenkov amplification of phonons. So, um, so we had this great grad student, Tron Anderson, who developed the theory for all of this model. Um, and uh, exactly this model describes the process I just told you about where an electron can emit a phonon, that phonon can stimulate the emission of another phonon, and this leads to a cascading process where phonons are exponentially growing across the sample, all right? And it turns out that this can explain both the um, suppression of the conductivity and also the noise features that we saw at low frequencies. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into this model anymore. Just say that Tron developed it. It was very nice. Um, it described very well in our paper. Um, and the important point, though, is that this model fits very well our conductivity data, OK? Uh, and actually, it fits it with only one fitting parameter, which is the time it takes for a phonon to transit from one side of our device to the other. Um, and so what's nice is that we have data on two different size samples. We can extract the time it takes for it to for the phonons that go across the sample, and it matches very well with the, um, the velocity of a particular acoustic phonon mode, the longitudinal acoustic phonon mode in our material. So it seems to match up that this is a process by which phonons are being amplified across our device, and then they're traveling down. All right, uh, so let me skip all this because I want to get to the NV data, all right? So let's just say we have a bunch of data on the global measurement. And that's all cool, seems consistent with this Cherenkov model. But what we really like to see is this exponential growth of phonons that I just mentioned, right? Because that's kind of the cool thing, right? So you, you, you have an electronic system, drive them a high voltage, and now they start emitting like tons of phonons. And the phonons are growing exponentially as you go across the sample. All right, and these phonons are, are sound waves, right? But they're sound waves of very high frequency, terahertz frequencies, actually. Uh, so it's kind of cool that you can generate it's not ultrasound, it's what they call hypersound, some people. Um, OK, so the phonons are, are growing exponentially. And so the point is, maybe that leads to a spatially dependent noise. Can we see that with our local current noise sensor? So um, in particular, what we would expect is that um, uh, a clear symmetry of the noise profile would appear. So what would happen is that as the phonons, uh, as electrons are traveling to the right, the phonons will be exponentially growing to the right. All right, but if you reverse the direction of the current, then it should be growing the opposite direction. Likewise, if we flip the type of carrier, okay, which flips the sign of the current, if we switch from electrons to holes, which is something that you can do with graphene, then we would expect the, um, the direction of this amplification to switch sign as well. So that's what we, um, so we came up with this idea, then we decided to test it with the NV centers, all right? 
here's a quick picture of our NV setup. It's a cryogenic NV, um, setup. It's a confocal microscope, microwave lines, graphene transport lines. We have a came up with a uh, bow implemented a kind of nice uh, um, way to read out the NV center efficiently at low temperature that people had not done before using resonant readout. And again, this is our sample, which is a graphene device on top of a diamond substrate with NV centers inside of it. All right, and again, we're doing a, a, a relaxation measurement of the, which is gonna probe the current fluctuations in the graphene. All right, so let's look at the spatial dependence of the noise. Um, so this is a NV center. Uh, this is a map, a fluorescence map of the NV centers here. And we're gonna measure the um, magnetic relaxation rate, which is gonna tell us the current fluctuations in the graphene from this NV center, which is located like 50 nanometers away from the graphene. Um, and I want to point out here that we're not scanning the NV centers. They're just a bunch of them sitting underneath the graphene device. OK, so first, we're going to measure the noise as a function of the direction of the current. So I'm going to have an NV center, which is kind of like more towards the end of the device. And we're going to shoot um, hole carriers in, through our graphene device, and they're going to come downstream. And what we see is that as we increase the bias of the graphene device, um, we see that, as expected, the current noise increases. OK, so this is our anomalous noise signal, which we think is coming from this um, phonon amplification effect. Um, and so what's important is that if we reverse the direction of the current so that now the NV center is actually sitting upstream, we don't see very much noise. So the current noise is actually um, has a spatial profile. OK, it's very asymmetric with current direction. Um, but what's cool is that we can actually flip the uh, direction, the sign of the carriers by changing the doping from holes to electrons, okay? And we get, see that the profile flips side, okay? So now we get large noise when we change, put the current the other direction. Um, and so the important thing here is not the direction of the electrical current, but the direction of carriers or the direction of momentum uh, flow in our system. That's gonna determine where the noise is gonna be the largest. Um, and so just as the last thing then, um, the kind of last thing that we could do is we could map out the current noise at all these different points of our devices by measuring different NV centers. And what we saw was that indeed, the local magnetic noise grows exponentially as we go across the device in the direction of the carrier flow. And if we flip the direction of the current, the profile flips the other way around, growing in the opposite direction. And this we could uniquely do because of having this nanoscale magnetometer, which can measure uh, the current fluctuation profile, which is something that really has never been done before, measuring um, the spatial dependence of current fluctuations. OK, so that ends my talk. Um, um, as far as these NB magnetometry is concerned, um, we observed this um, anomalous noise signal, which we ascribed by, to this phonon Cherenkov amplification effect in graphene. And um, we were able to measure um, its details by looking at the spatial profile of the current noise. And so just briefly as one little bit of outlook, um, I mean, this phonon Cherenkov effect is interesting. I think there's some interesting future experiments we can do with this to make tunable uh, um, uh, phonon lasers, for example, or generators of terahertz phonons more generically. Um, I do want to highlight a bunch of researchers which are evaluating other interesting experiments for using NV centers to probe TD materials. In particular, um, a colleague of mine, Inti Sodeman, is coming here to UC Irvine. He's a theorist. Um, he's predicted that measuring the magnetic noise uh, from a spin liquid could be used as a smoking gun uh, indicator for um, the existence of a spin-on Fermi surface. So that's a pretty interesting, very recent prediction of his in his archive paper. And then I also want to highlight uh, my neighbors at uh, UC Santa Barbara and UCSD, Ani Zhe and uh, Chen Hui Du, who are both uh, probing using cryogenic NV probing of, of 2D materials, uh, looking at electron currents and also spin waves as well. Um, and then lastly, just briefly, let me mention that um, I have my new group here at UC Irvine. We've been building up over the course of the last two years. Um, things are still not quite so uh, developed to really talk about it much, but I'm just going to say that in general, we're developing new techniques for measuring and fabricating uh, quantum materials, and I hope to talk more about that in the future. So with that, I thank you all for listening. And that's the end of my talk. And here's acknowledgments.
Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, Thank you. Questions? I, I have a question. Um, so in the Chernkov experiment, um, mm -hmm. the phonons are emitted up in a certain direction. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Do they reflect at the edge of the sample and go back? Or yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we wonder exactly about that. And um, basically, we did analysis where um, probably they are actually um, uh, uh, reflecting off the, uh, some some percentage of it reflects off the edge of the sample. But then the, once they reflect, they're moving the wrong direction. Okay, and you can analyze like what happens to those phonons that get reflected, and they basically will very quickly uh, decay. Because they're, mm -hmm. they're they're mm -hmm. they're they're wrong direction of the application process. So, so it's in the model, basically. Yes, it comes out very cleanly that it it, mm -hmm. it will not nothing those those would just be extinguished, basically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Not a problem. Um, so I have actually a naive question about the spatial profile of the current noise, um, yep. which is, I guess, what causes it. Um, why, why is that, why is there some, um, I guess, preferred region that mm -hmm. exhibits larger noise? Yeah, yeah. So I realized I went way too quick. I think I was too ambitious to <laughs> include both the NMR and the, so normally I spend more time just in the noise. So, um, so what we know for sure, or what we're very confident about is that um, the phonon population is growing exponentially across the sample, right? Um, and then the idea is, okay, how does that affect the current noise, right? And so our thinking is just that, you know, the more phonons you have, the more scattering of electrons that you get, okay? And, um, and, and that'll be some sort of Poissonian process, right? Uh, and so, the, and so that'll lead to, to increased current fluctuations. So more phonons that you have in some region of your sample, the more um, fluctuations you'll get in the current because it, it, it scatters with the electrons. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Happy to answer like the most basic questions about anything I talked about. <laughs> Realize this talk uh, kind of combines a lot of different <laughs> things together and went kind of fast. I was wondering how you get all the way up to frequencies of two or three gigahertz when the spacing of the NV center is of that order as well for the frequency measurements. Okay, so um, are you talking about the noise measurements or the uh, uh, like like in this like what I have on this slide right here? Um, I suppose. Or the or the NMR measurements. I think that the, for the NMR measurements that you're going. Oh, to okay, using. great. So the NMR measurements. Um, so we're we're dealing with NV centers that are like very much isolated from each other. Okay, and then you were asking how do we um, how do we choose different frequencies? Is that what you're asking? Or how do you get up to frequencies that are on the order of? I, th I think you mentioned there, there were like some plots where the frequencies got up to gigahertz scale. Mm, okay. Yeah. So. Um, you cannot do NMR at the gigahertz frequency scales. No. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I, I clicked way too many times, of course. <laughs> All right. Try not to. Uh, yeah. So, um, so the NMR measurements were at the megahertz frequency. Okay. Okay. And um, there is a limitation to using these like specific pulse sequences that are indicated here. Um, I think you really can only access like I can't remember maybe tens of megahertz or something like that. Um, and so if you want to get up to gigahertz, you have to kind of switch your measurement scheme to something different. So for example, these uh, spin relaxation rate measurements, uh, which don't involve any fancy pulse sequences, those take full advantage of the full transition frequency, the NV center, and then those can go to much higher frequencies. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I have a very basic question. Awesome, please. <laughs> so you're basically using a defect state and when you apply a green light how to, I, I don't understand to what state the electron can move. Yes, and, so <laughs> yes. great question. So what happens is that um, you have spin and it's just sitting there at room temperature or whatever temperature. And so probabilistically it's gonna be in either one one of these three different 
spin orientations, okay? Um, and that doesn't do you any good. And so what you wanna do is you want it to be in just one spin orientation. And so that's what happens when you shine green light. Shining green light causes it to all go into the zero or like 90% of it. 90% of the time, it'll end up in the zero state. And now you, you've, you've effectively cooled the system by shining a laser on it. Oh, I, I meant that there is no excited state that can be excited by green light, I thought. Oh, uh, how do you, how, how do you, the, the green laser excites the, excites the optical dipole moment. Yeah, so shining green light causes it to go to, uh, here, actually, I think I have it in the previous slide. Yeah, so the way you think about it is that uh, the green, so this is the, the spin levels are down here, okay, right? And then you shine green light, it excites it up very high, um, and it can absorb oh, that they, energy, yep. Uh, is there a, a, a state to, to go up, up there? Yeah, basically, you think of it as kind of like it, it, um, it, it generates some phonons to allow it. Yeah, so there are states available here where you can think of it as like a phonon assistant process. Oh, okay, process. okay. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Any other so, questions? Yeah, so is there, to follow up on the last question, <clears throat> is there a simple explanation why all the decay would be um, into the um, magnetic zero state instead of the other two? Yeah, no, there is an explanation. I'm not so great at explaining it, but um, uh, the basic idea is that um, if it's in the zero state, it tends to just it get excited and then come back down to zero again in a spin conserving process. So the zero state is preserved. Um, but these ms equals plus minus one states, when they get excited, they have some probability to not decay radiatively, but actually decay through a non-radiative process. So there's a little bit of spin orbit coupling, which kind of causes the spin to be information to get lost and it kind of depolarizes. And this only affects these guys. And so because of that, the plus minus one states tend to get their spins reset while the zero state is preserved. And that naturally leads to a pumping, a, a polarization. Mm -hmm. um, if it's in zero, it'll stay in zero. If it's in plus minus one, the laser kind of mixes it up. And so if you just keep shining the laser, eventually you're gonna get it into the zero state. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right, if there are no other questions, um, let's thank Javier again for a great talk. Thank you for joining. Great, thanks everyone for coming. Yep, take care.